Um, let's jump right into it. Uh, let's see. So this week was interesting for me. Uh, wait, happy, it was Silas' birthday yesterday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Silas. More grace, more grace, more grace. Um, and it was my birthday on uh, Wednesday, right? And so thank you. Thank you very much. But I bring that up. I bring that up. So <laughs> I didn't bring it up. So I guess I say happy birthday, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. But, okay, calm down. <laughs> So if I bring it up because I think I'm going to, it's somehow going to tie into my message today, how we'll find out. But So for me, birthdays are very interesting. How many, how many people love birthdays? I think there are two kinds of people. People who are super excited about their birthdays and the people who are like, yeah. Okay, if you're on the, I'm super excited, like birthday week, like birthday week, birthday, let me see your hands. All right. If you're on the, yeah. All right, cool. All right, all right, cool. So I, I think I think I'm more on the eh type of, of birthdays, and and I've I've asked myself why, and I think what happens on my birthday I get very reflective. Do I do I have witnesses? Anybody like that? You know, you know, it gets it's exciting because you know I mean it's a new year, you know, but with the when something starts, something ends, right? You can't have a a beginning without an end, right? Something needs to end for something to begin. Right, and I think what happens on my birthday is I I get very reflective, and I don't know about you or maybe it's human nature, but how my thinking or my thought begins to go, it begins to skew. It's like the the calculation is always quite negative, not intentionally, but we always like we seem to focus on where it's like a new age, a new year, and where am I as opposed to where I thought I would be, right? And we begin to focus more on what we haven't achieved rather than what we have accomplished. I don't know if it's a me thing, if it happens to you as well. It's like we have sudden amnesia and we just begin to focus on all the things we haven't done, all the things we said we would do, where we thought we would be as opposed to where we are. And we never stop to think about how far we've come. Isn't it interesting? Because we might not be where we want to be, but we are not where we were. And if we take the time to actually step back and actually see it holistically um, and see it from a, the actual perspective, we begin to see that there's so much that we have to thank God for. You know, I've said this many times, um, and, and, you know, I say it casually, but the truth of the matter is we only get the liberty or the luxury to complain and feel sad about where we are not because we are alive. Yeah? Because only the living have problems, right? <laughs> only people who are alive can say, hey, yeah, I'm nobody I want to be. <laughs> because we have the luxury to do so. You know, there's so many things that we take for granted that we do without thinking. We, you know, I'm moving my hand and I'm not thinking my hand is moving. I'm just thinking my hand should move and it moves. Until you get to a place where you want to... I've been in a place where I hurt myself, where I needed surgery when I was working in the gym. And I wanted to move this... But this hand was not moving. I told the hand to move, but it was not answering me. <laughs> Until I had surgery, I had to learn to get that, you know. So, so many things that we kind of take for granted and how we begin to think. And I think one of the reasons why that gets us, or maybe me, and I'm not saying us, I may not lump you into my thing, is, you know, there's always this feeling of this is where I'm at, this is where I want to be, but how do I get there? Sometimes when we think about the future, um, there's an uncertainty that comes with it because we are uncomfortable with not knowing. I think if you could ask anybody here, if you could have a superpower, what would you want? Maybe one or two. One is, I want, some people say, I want to be rich, rich, just money. The second one is, I want to know the future. It's, it's one or the other, I think. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. Tell me what, you know, tell me. I want to know. I want to know. I just remember this song my mom used to, she, she liked a lot. When I was just a little, am I telling my age? My, I asked my mother, what will I be? You know that song? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. 
Que sera, sera. Oh, there you go. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Case. You know? Yeah, but we want to see the future. You see that song? But we want to see the future. And I think it comes with the need to want to control or want to be in the know. And I began to think to myself, what is it like? Because when you celebrate, or when, for me also, Whenever something major, something good happens in my life, rather than focus on the accomplishment, I, I focus on the responsibility that comes with the accomplishment. <laughs> and so everybody's just saying, hey, I'm like, hey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. So this is the end of something, but this is the beginning of something else. You know, um, I was having a conversation last week, and I was having a conversation. We're talking about planning and the future, and, and you know, I was having a conversation with some of the leaders, and you know, in 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 thinking about what the future holds, or having these conversations, it's like let's bring it here. The cave is three. I was thinking about that. What does that mean? The cave is three. We've done this for three years. You know, you talk about Bible numerology. Three is the is the number of completion, right? So for something, something is ended for it to be complete. But like we said, something ends, something begins. So what does that look like? What does that look like? And a lot of times when we go through life, you'll find out that there'll be seasons in your life, or I find out the seasons in my life where I'm looking into the future. And we almost, you know, now there are two kinds of people again, and I said this yesterday when I was talking to my people. Um, the people who plan, who are very administrative, you're one of those, let me see your hands up, very administrative, you plan, like two year ago, five year ago, 10 year ago. You one of those, any one of those? If you're not one of those and you're like, then there are some people I think who don't plan, but just kind of go with the flow and make it happen. If you're one of those, let me see. I think I'm. I think I'm more of a go with the flow kind of guy, you know. And I, I said to them, I said it's not that I don't believe that there's anything wrong with planning, but I feel that life is so unpredictable that one thing can shift the course of your life. The course, everything can change. One phone call, one conversation, one decision, one relationship, one one job opportunity, something, anything can shift you one minute you're here, the next minute you're there. If I bet you if I asked ninety percent of the people in the room if they knew that they would be where they are six months ago, if you knew this is where you would be in a particular place in your life, whether it's in work or career or ministry or whatever, and you knew this is where you'd be. Let me see your hands up. You just knew. Nobody? Cause what life has showed us is life is interesting. I've got to think of the Bible. I've got to think about, okay, what are people who have been in this similar situation? And how do you navigate these times when you look forward? And, you know, if we're being honest, not knowing the future can be scary, can be uncomfortable. Because all the information you have is what you have. All the information you have is what you have. Does that make any sense? So you are looking forward to try to predict what tomorrow would be, but all you have, the information you have is based on what you have in your hand. Right? So what am I going to be tomorrow? But I can only ask, I can only surmise based on what I see today. But I also used to say this as well. If all you see is what you see, then you're blind. If all you see is what you see, then you're blind. <laughs> because if you make decisions based on only what and it's it's almost like a catch 22 how can you how can you make decisions based on what you don't have but then the bible says at the end of the day it's not the world that was formed was not by it was from things unseen and he says that at the end of the day that we call things that are not as though they were so the the bible mentality is not to make decisions on what you have but what you will have so how do you navigate? I began to talk to myself. I was like, okay, what does it look like? Because I look at where I'm at. But it began to make sense why the children of Israel would always create monuments and things of memorials past. Because in those situations when they would step back and give an account of their lives, when you have a memorial, you can look back to remind yourself of what God has done. 
Because what tends to happen is when we look at where we're at, we look at what we don't have, what God hasn't done, what we haven't accomplished, what we feel like God should have done for us, or what X, Y, and Z, and our eyes tend to veer in that direction. The equation gets to be skewed in that direction. But when you have a monument that reminds you of what God has done, because they used to erect this intentionally, it shifts or redirects your purpose or your focus to see how God has brought you through and how far he's brought you from. And it gives you hope for where God is taking you to. Somebody say, God is taking me somewhere. I began to ask myself a question and I said, what does it feel like? Has anybody been in this place of being uncomfortable before when you look at where you feel like you should be and where you thought you would be versus where you are and how they navigated through this 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 journey? And, and then I, I, I thought about Joseph. Now, pause. When we talk about Joseph, everybody looks at Joseph from one perspective. And I, I want us to look at it from a different um, perspective today. I'm just going to... I'm just, I don't know if I'm preaching, I'm just conversating. Is that a word, conversing? Con- con- conversing, not conversating. Uh, I just felt the spirit of Pastor Kemi. Just like, oh, oh my God. So I just had to, I, I caught it real quick. Conversing. Sorry, Pastor Kemi. Um, when we think about Joseph, you know, I think we, we take that story for granted because the perspective at which we look at is, is almost like, should I say it's God-like? When I say God-like, when you're reading a story, you have the luxury of, of reading the story from a God-like perspective because you're outside the story. So you have information that the character that is experiencing it does not have, right? So everybody is a character in the story of their lives. The only person that can see the story of the fullness of what it is is God. But for you and me, every day we live, we are experiencing a plot or in the, in the script that was written for our lives and we experience it as it unfolds. Because we are not in tomorrow, we don't know what our story is going to be tomorrow. It's interesting that we can only look back. There's sometimes when you look at people's stories and say, ah, that boy that was nowhere yesterday, look at this boy today. Ah, who would have known 10 years ago that this boy would be here? Or who would have known four months ago that this guy would be here? Or who would have, but because life unfolds and we never know these things, if you look at it from the perspective of Joseph, we read the story of Joseph as ones who are outside the story. So it's just like, here's this boy who, you know, this happened and this happened and they sold him, then he became king. Hey, yeah, happily ever after, wrapped wrap the ribbon. That's a great story. But I want us to examine the story as the character. And, and, and because it, it gives a different perspective completely, you know? Um, Joseph is living his life just like we're living our lives. And the Bible was, was to tell us in Genesis 37 that he had just turned 17, right? It was, or he was 17. You know, so he's a teenager. He's chilling. You know, everything is cool. And I'm sure... As a 17-year-old, most of us have been 17 here. You know, as 17, we had an idea of what we thought we would be or what we wanted to be in the future. It's funny. I can use me personally. If they looked at me... <laughs> if you looked at me... <laughs> If you looked at me 17, when I was 17 or 18 or looked at my academic track record or whatever the case is or where I was, you would have sworn that I'd be in corporate like in a 9 to 5 as a consultant. Guaranteed. Facts. That was my life. 9 to 5, consultant, MBA, all of this, all of that, Accenture this, this, that, oil and everything else on that business track. You know, I could gab with the best of them. You know, top of my class, all of that academic. I thought that was my life. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait, how am I here? Right? But, anyways, let's, unless I digress, you know, probably went left field and all the my <laughs> Nollywood, Hollywood, all the woods. Somehow I fell in the woods, right? <laughs> Somehow I got into the woods and I'd be able to get out the woods. Um, Joseph is living his life. Now, we know that Joseph was the favorite son of his father. And it's interesting because I began to see a lot of similarities between Joseph and Jesus. And he realized that Joseph was an archetype of Jesus in so many ways, right? Let's just run through real quickly. I'm going to come back. Joseph, son, son, uh, favorite son of his father, Jesus, son of God, right? 
Joseph uh, favored <laughs> um, coat, coat, coat of many colors, sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus <laughs> favored, <laughs> sold for 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> they tore off the robes of uh, Joseph and cast him into the, into the pit. They tore off the tunic of Jesus and they put him in the ground, right? Quite interesting. Um, but Joseph, favorite son of his father, living his life, he was favored not because he wanted to be favored, but the guy was just favored. There was nothing that he did. His father just loved him. And that in itself was a problem. And because that in itself was a problem, his brothers envied him. And we know the story. He got a coat of many colors. And, you know, X, Y, Z. While he's minding his business, he gets a dream that tells him this is what... In fact, it was just a dream. The dream, he didn't necessarily... He, he didn't have Daniel's gift of interpretation. So the dream wasn't... He didn't mean... For him, didn't mean it was an indication of his future. It was just a dream. How many people have had dreams? How many times have we dreamt things? Does not mean that that's a. I mean, we have random dreams. Doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen in the future. There's sometimes I've had dreams that I knew that was going to happen. Like one or two or three times I had some certain dreams. Like, ah, this is going to happen. But some people don't have that gift. Some people we dream. So he just had a dream and he was curious. Like, look, let me show you this crazy dream I had. And he tells his family quite innocently. It was his family that brought interpretation to the dream. He wasn't the dream interpreter. He just had the dream. His mom said, wait, what are you trying to say? You're going to say that the count, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, 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 eleven, so ten, so my own standard, uh, my own stood, sorry, stay standing, and yours, yours, but so you're saying that you will bow before you? He didn't say that. He just said, this is my dream. That's all he said. He had another dream. I told him again, and he told his father because his brothers were haters. He's like, listen, you guys aren't happy with me for my dream, and then he wants to tell his dad, and his dad says, what kind of dream is that? I mean, you know, we've talked about it, you know, be careful you tell your dream to all of that stuff, X, Y, and Z. But I'm going to put it out there as well, you know. When you have certain dreams as well, you know, it's not about, it's not everything you talk about. You got to be careful. You got to be custodians of your dream. We've, we've said this before. Because you got to be careful when, you, when you, in, I'm talk, thinking about, back to me have been in that state of being reflective. If my dream is to be a, uh, to be a, do, a, a millionaire in dollars, and I'm frustrated because I'm a thousandaire in dollars. But I'm complaining to somebody whose dream is just to survive. He, he, he has no, that's, that's to, his dream is just to make it. And just to have food in his fridge. That's his dream. If I have a conversation with a person like that, the guy will almost curse me. That you, you, are, you are worried about... What you are dreaming for is luxury, as far as this person is concerned, not you. This person, person X. But for the person that is frustrated for me, it's a necessity because that is my dream. But for the person whose dream is not there, it is a frust it is like luxury and he almost wants to abuse that. What is wrong with you? You it's like you want too much, right? Which is why you gotta be careful who to whom you share your dreams to and with. I heard a quote that was very good. It says, um, you know, you never hear a tree grow. Trees don't make noise when they grow. You just see them growing. It says that you, you never hear a tree grow, right? So it just, it just, trees just growing. Sometimes, you know, in your dreams, you got to be careful, surround yourself with the people who understand, who harness, who will push your dream. But, you know, just didn't have that. Anyways, his brothers hate him, and from that moment, it's like, not only are you favored, now you're having stupid dreams. <laughs> not only are you favored, you're having stupid dreams. <laughs> okay, so a guy, you need to humble you. Not that, the Bible didn't say that he was proud. He just told, it was like, how dare you have the, the ability or the capacity to even dare to expect something like that. Because when your dream is bigger than the people you're telling it to, it will come through as arrogance. Do you get what I'm saying? When you are in a place that you are bigger than, if you are a fisherman for the aquarium, but you are a fisherman for the ocean, every fish in the aquarium will, be, will feel like you're arrogant to say you want to swim in the ocean. How dare you think like that? Right? <laughs> when I dare to say, I say, I'm going to Hollywood. I say, because I'm going. That guy, calm down. Come calm down. This is a lie. That's where I'm going. But 
but they, 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 it's like how dare you so now we, we have to humble you we have to bring you back to earth if you tell the wrong set of people their job they will feel like it's to level you and to humble you and that's what the brothers felt like they had to do and so we know how the story unfolded and so joseph is there he's been sent by his father to go and meet his brothers in the field now he also shows that he was not an arrogant or prideful person and he did not believe that his dream meant that he was bigger than his brother because if he believed so he would have told his father do you know who you are sending to go and it's not not i i do you know who i am i'm the deliverer of this family you know, there are certain things, reasons why God will hide, will hide certain details in dreams when it comes to us. Because sometimes he knows that if he gives us the full details, we can't handle it. Both good and bad. If God would show us a future, if God would tell some people now, in full months, you'll be a multi-millionaire problem. From now, you start misbehaving. Start working like, what's this guy's name? Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this boy is of the streets. I don't know the guys. What's his name? What's his name? Put the way. There you go. We just are working like this. Now, calm down. There are certain people. Have you found that the most, the most, the, the, most the, the richest men in the world, all of them are very humble? Do you think it's a by accident? Like, like most of them. Do you they think it's accidental? No, Elon Musk is humble. No, let me tell you. He's humble. If you, if you look at the amount of money he has and what he does, he's humble. Are you joking? Are you, are you moving mad? <laughs> Do you know? Even me, I don't, I don't think about money. I'm already getting arrogant. <laughs> Do you know what you, you, you're saying? What are you saying? He just bought Twitter for how much? $4 billion. $44 billion. Calm down. See, my voice has gone up. <laughs> Let me bring it back down. Forty-four billion dollars. Man's is humble. One billion is nine hundred and ninety-nine million. One time times forty-four. Some people's generations, generations, generations. <laughs> Some countries generate. The man said, "How much you want? Take um, was it forty-four? That's it. Are you mad? <laughs> I'm sorry, my voice has gone up again. <laughs> Come back." <clears throat> But most of them, you will find, are humble because they just, Peso just walks around like, you know, Zuckerberg is like, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, you know, Elon Musk says he's homeless. He doesn't have a house, he just sleeps on his friend's couch. He's humble. He's humble. He says he just goes from house to house and squats in houses. You have 44 billion and you're squatting. So people, if you give them half a million, Nigerian politicians, if a Nigerian politician was Elon Musk, they'll buy a spaceship, a spaceship for land in the middle of Times Square, just spaceship, just to show that they come with entourage of jets. Do you get what I'm saying? But he was, he wasn't humble, he wasn't proud because he won, he goes to go carry the errands out for his dad, and then his brothers see him and they're just like, so you have the audacity to come. They were just angry. He was just coming to deliver. He didn't say nothing. They were angry. I want you to experience this story not as a, a, a reader, but as the character. You just go to meet your brothers that you love, and the next thing they do is they rip your your clothes, your 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 favorite. Because every see, see, when you're favored, every everything you do is a slap in, in your hater's face. Even when you are not doing anything. It's like how are you just existing? And says the heart of man is evil and desperately wicked because jealousy will happen. They were jealous not because of anything he did, but because of who he was. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Understand that some people will not like you because of who you are, period. Not about what you do or don't do, but the fact that you are who you are is uh, it's 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's unsettling to certain people. And Joseph gets there and he's cast in the pit. They, his brothers rip off his jacket and throw him in the pit. Now, I want you to imagine this as Joseph. In the morning, you are your father's favorite son. By mid-afternoon, you are in the well. How? 
And I think that is, that, is, that is a good picture of how unpredictable life can be. The morning you can be up. In the afternoon you can be down. How? I was reading a story online about somebody who, uh, apparently she, she was, she was uh, I guess, an actor in the East and she had talked to a friend the night before and she was cleaning something in church or something and she just slumped and then she was dead. How? Somebody, you know, got on, you know, some influencer, social media influencer guy apparently got killed and it was in the car and then a trailer or something smashed the car, fell on him or something. How? How unpredictable life can be. And, and imagine being Joseph thinking, but, but, but how am I here? And not knowing what the next two hours would be. One minute you knew where your life was going. The next minute, nothing that you did, but life has changed so drastically. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be. And I dare say that you and I, whether we know it or not, are like Joseph because we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. We don't know what the next hour is going to be. We don't know what the next second is going to be. And we have this false sense. It's, it's interesting because we have this false sense or this ideology that not only are we going to wear control, but we're going to be here next week, next month, next year, five years, ten years. We just know it. In fact, we're planning tomorrow I'm going here with certainty. Next tomorrow I'm going here. As if we have any control of what tomorrow brings. So Joseph is in this place that has no, he has no control. And he's in the pit. In the pit. Looking up. I want you to picture this. You are the favorite son. Now you're in a dry pit. Looking up. <laughs> you're thinking, what is going on? Not knowing what the next minute was going to be. All the while, his brothers are having conversations of what they were going to do with him. In fact, they said they were going to kill him. And then his brother said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in the pit. And that was his way of God's mercy. Put him in the pit, right? Put him in the pit. How can being put in the pit be God's mercy? Sometimes when you find yourself in the pit, it could be God's mercy. Let's stop right there. Can, can we just stop right there for a second? Sometimes the most traumatic things that might happen in your life, you may not understand, but it could be God's way of showing you mercy. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And in that moment, Joseph is thinking, God, you showed me this dream and all of a sudden I'm in the pit. How is my life in the pit? And sometimes God will let you fall in the pit because he's trying to save you for the palace. I just felt that one. They said, throw him in the pit. And that was God's way of showing mercy. So sometimes we may not feel it, but thank. He says, in all things, give thanks. This is the will of God the Father towards you. Because everything, in every area, in anything in your life, pit or palace, give thanks. Highs or lows, give thanks. Because again, remember, we're looking at this story not as somebody outside the story, but as the character experiencing the story. He's in the pit and he's thinking, what is going on? And we know how the story goes. The next thing you find, we find, is that he is brought out. We don't know how long he was in the pit, but a couple of hours must have passed. Can you imagine the thoughts that were going through his mind? Why am I here? How am I here? What did I do? How did I? What? <laughs> what they're really going to kill me? But, and I think... God in his mercy gave him the dream because he knew the pit was coming. Right? And which is why I think it's important, just like the Israelites did, they knew something about building monuments to the things God has done. Because when you find yourself in the pits of life, you have to remember the promises that God has given you. What do you do if he kept looking around and all he saw was stones and bricks and an empty well, that's all he saw. He had to, rem there's something he had to hold, to hold on to to keep him going mentally. Because understand, he knew, he had no idea what, what was happening to him. Then we know as the story unfolds that he was taken out of the well 
and he was sold. Now, bear in mind, we know where he was sold to. He didn't know where he was sold to because his transaction happened outside the well. Are you with me? He's in the pit, not knowing what conversation is being had. And then they, oh, there's some people traveling to it. You know what? How much? Yes, brother, how much? How, they bargained on him. 30, no, that's too much. Uh, what's the guy? So I'm saying, like, what can he do? Is it all? Is it, no, you know what? Yeah, We'll give you 20. 20. Last price. Going one goes at 20 sold. Cool. Sell him for 20 pieces of silver. Then they bring him out. And they give him to these guys. And he's put in a cart, caravan, whatever. And the cart is moving. Where am I going? It's almost like the proverbial, what does my future hold? Have you ever asked the question, what does my future hold? Because your present reality does not show anything for any, 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 any glimpse of a great future. Now understand that the distance between Canaan and Egypt is 837 kilometers. <laughs> That's a long time. Is 837 or 873, either or, but over 800. Now, let me give you context. Third Milan Bridge going one way is like 10, 11 kilometers, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's just running one way. So if we say 10 or 11 or 80, <laughs> 80 Third Milan Bridges just going. Just imagine 80. Now, don't think about it in a, in a, in a car. Because when you think about 80, most of the time, Tommy Land Bridge, when we think about it, we're looking from experience of driving. Are you with me? When there's traffic, it's even bad. But have you ever walked Third Mainland Bridge before? <laughs> I don't think anybody will walk Third Mainland Bridge by choice. I don't think anybody will just decide to walk. Something must have happened. That makes you walk, whether you are extremely broke and have no money, you have no choice, and all your only option is to use your legs. But most in, most of the time, people in Paris, but we went a bus, some kind of four wheel modular transportation to carry you. But then, when you think about it as a slave, chains and shackles. I, I want you to picture this as the character, not as the reader. Those who were probably leading the caravan were on the horse with the cart. But the slaves, most likely than not, were walking behind the cart. Can you imagine walking for 80 kilometers, not knowing, 800 kilometers, not knowing where you are going? Not knowing what your future is saying? Not knowing what tomorrow is saying. It's a very humbling feeling. And that's what Joseph was experiencing. And I dare say that a lot of times, some of us, that is exactly how we feel. When we stand and it's like we're going through life and we don't know where we're going. We're going, but we don't know where we're going. We're walking, but we don't know where we're walking to. And when you are in that place, it can weigh very heavy on your heart. What do you do in those situations? And I'm about to tell you. I began to ask myself the question, I'm like, how do you how do you keep on walking when you can't see anything ahead of you? It's easy to have dreams when you are in a place of success. Oh, can we can we can we can we can we, can we keep it real? It's easy to say, man, my next five years I'm going to blow when there's money in your account, <laughs> when everything is working right. So, ah, next two years I'm going to be ah, it's going to be ah. But then it's harder to talk about your next two years when you look at your account and it's like zero. <laughs> Bible says, call those things that are not as though they were. 
And I found that there were those in those situations that what they did was remind God of what he had said. I almost, I, it's, it's, it's 102 when I, and I, when I want to stop because we're over time. Um, can I ask you guys for 10 minutes? Is that okay? Can I take 10 minutes? Is that okay? And try to round this up as quickly as I can. Um, but I found that what, 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 what they do is they remind God of his word. I was reading this book. I just started reading it, Think and Grow Rich. And it tells the story of this young kid who had decided that he was going to be Thomas Edison's partner. <laughs> Thomas Edison he said he was going to he was going to work with Thomas Edison. And when he made the decision, um, the, 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 the decision to do that, he had no money. He had no. But he just said, "I'm going to be." So he jumped on a, a train to the, to New York. Now, when he said jump on a train, he didn't have money, so he just he he jumped on those um, those cargo those ones that are carrying coal and stuff. He just entered. <laughs> And he went to Thomas Edison's office and he stood before them and said, I'm going to be your business partner. I'm going to work for you. I'm going to work with you as your partner in business. Ragged, dirty, <laughs> cool, covered his face, looking like a riffraff. Thomas Edison is thinking to himself, like, guy, in what world? But he said there was something about his belief and his desire that he didn't know. He said, okay, you know what? You've come this long, you know what? Go on be an intern just come on you just want to work how about work for me first before you can work with me right and it made him an intern but i find that when you are in those situations you need to have something to hold on to and i believe that joseph as he was walking as he was walking all he had he didn't have his family anymore he didn't have his favorite status anymore he didn't have his coats that told them who he was he didn't have the validation of his family or as a prince. All he had then was his hands, his feet shackled, and his God. That's all he had. And all he had, and probably the only positive thing in his life at that moment, were the dreams. That's all he had, <laughs> were the dreams. A pigment of his imagination. <laughs> a, 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 a dream that was so far-fetched from his present reality, but that's all he had in that moment. But guess what? That was enough to sustain him 837 kilometers. Because guess what? The Bible says, if the Bible says he was sold in verse 30, chapter 39, but he says he was purchased when he got to Egypt. Getting to Egypt, he's realizing, oh, this is where I'm at. And then the Bible says, but he was sold into Potiphar's house, but God was with him. In the bleakest time of his life, everything was saying that he was abandoned, but God was with him. Even in moments when you can't see your next step and all you see is bleakness, God is with you. Even when your present reality is saying that everything is going left and there is nothing good that can come from your life, God is with you. Even when you are in the pit of life, walking to an unknown destination, not knowing what tomorrow holds, God is with you. It says God was with him. Facing what it felt like was annihilation. I remember the story of Jehoshaphat in, in Second Second Chronicles. I have what? I have about five minutes. I want to show you something. Second Chronicles 20. Jehoshaphat is the king and an army has come against him. I'm going to paraphrase. What do you do in those situations? You remind God of his word. Because guess what? I realized that he will never leave you in those situations without a word. Now understand what was interesting was God didn't speak to Joseph in the pit. God didn't speak to him when he was shackled walking to Egypt. God didn't speak to him when he was being sold to Potiphar's house. God spoke to him at the beginning of the story in a dream. Because God knew when he would need it the most. It would have been so much nicer if he was in the pit and then in that darkness a light appeared and said, My son, I am with you. And this day you shall go to Egypt. 
There will be a confidence as you are being sold because you know what's happening. Joseph, after, after Moses died, the angel appeared to Joseph, I'm sorry, Joshua, and said, you know what, now my servant is dead, but guess what? I will be with you all the days of your life. Go. There's some kind of confidence that you have. And a lot of times, when we are in these situations, we're looking for that word for God to give us the confidence that we need. But if you take a step back to look and reflect, you realize that he already gave you what you needed before the season came. Again, we're so quick to, to, to focus. And this is why I say it's important to remember the things that God has said. Remember the things that God has done. Because you realize that so he will give you seeds for the seasons before they come. You need to have seed before you plant for the next season. You don't wait. To, and so go to, you don't go to the field and start looking for seed. You have to have your seed before you time to plant. Think about the seeds of hope and promise that God has deposited inside of you. And they were given to you not for then, but for now. Because of where he was taking you to. It says God was with him. Back to Jehoshaphat. They were, they were about to be attacked and this is his response. He, he, was being, he was being faced, he was facing an army that was clearly 10 times the size Two, country, two, uh, two uh, kings had come together to attack them, and he was clearly afraid. His resources were outnumbered, and the, from where he stood, it was like another Joseph situation. It was bleak. This was his response. Verse 5, it says this, and Jehoshaphat, this is 2 Chronicles 20, verse 5, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord. The Bible says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs in, right? And they're saved. He runs into the house of the Lord before the new court. And he says, O Lord God of, of, God of our fathers, are not thou... Oh, this is... Okay, no, I'm reading in KJV. Let me read it. What is that? NKJV. I'll read it from this. O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven and... Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? This is what he was doing. I, I, I love it because he, he's in trouble. <laughs> but he's reminding God of who he is. Like God has forgotten. But what he was doing there was he was not reminding God of who he is for God's benefit. <laughs> He was reminding God of who he is for his own benefits. I'll say that again. <laughs> it's almost like if me and you were about to go into, into a battle. And you know you need my help because I am your deliverer. When you are reminding me of the battle, he said, are you not the one that beats Shegun and Tunde and Fisayo? Where you blew Fikayo with your left hand and he fell down. Who can stand before you? You are, you are reminding him or you're reminding me for your benefit because you need me to stand for you. But the more you big me up, the more you are protected. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He was bigging God up. It's almost like when you go to those parties, we, you know, go to a Nigerian party and they start to, they see you and they start to sing your praises. <laughs> the motive of singing your praise is for you to give them money. You know that that is why they are singing your praise. You know it's a scam. You know it's all a it's a, it's a format, a script. They don't really send you like that. They want your money. There's sometimes when you come, they just send. They just give them a name. Just write names. Just give them the name. They know they don't they don't know who you are. Ha! Oma Odukoya. Oh, who knows me here? And they start. Dun, 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 dun. You know what they want. But the more they see, whether you like it or not, whether out of embarrassment, or whether after a while it seems to enter, because you can't block your ears. <laughs> you see, yeah, it's, dun, dun, they'll sing like that. Me? Like, okay, okay. You don't know when your hand enters your pocket and you start to give them money. Even more than what you plan. Okay, I'll give them 500. Bam. They'll sing again when they find the ah, they'll shake their singing. Next thing you know, it's almost like 
on autopilot. You just start to. That's why a lot of times I just, if I'm going for engagement, I just carry my money, <laughs> give me somebody else. I say, I don't have that finish, right? But he was picking God up. He said, Are you not God, our Father, who is in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms and the nations? In your hand, is there not power and might that no one is able to withstand you? In other words, see, I know what the situation is, but I know who you are. What do you do when you look at your future and you are unsettled by what the future says? You may not know what the future is, but you know who he is. You see, you might not be able to control the future, but I know one who holds my future. He says, I know the plans and the thoughts that I have concerning you. It's plans to prosper you, plans of hope, to bring you to a place of expected end. It might not look like anything is going the way it needs to go, but that's okay. What does my future hold? I have no idea, but guess what? I know one who holds my future. And as long as he holds my future, then my life is just because as long as he's alive, my future is secure. He says, are you not the one? Who is able to withstand you? As long as you as long as you don't sleep or slumber. As long as you are the one who writes the beginning author and the finisher of my faith. As long as it is you, I'm okay. I don't know what tomorrow may bring. I don't need to know what tomorrow may bring. As long as I know that you're there, I'm okay. Next verse. He says this. Are you not our God? Who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. Now, this is what he's doing. He's reminding God of what he's done in the past. Remember when we said it's important to have monuments? Remember what God has done? God, it was you that paid my school fees when I had no money. So God, if you did it before, you can do it again. God, it was you when I needed 50k for a hospital bill and I didn't know where it was going to come. Suddenly, I got a phone call. I was asking myself, how? God, if you did it before, you do it again. God, it was you when I said I was going to go to this and that school, but I had no means and my grades were not there. But I dared to believe because you said if you say it, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, I didn't know how it was going to happen. But guess what? If you did it before, you do it again. Yes. It's important you remind yourself of the things God has done in the moments when you can't see what tomorrow is saying because it gives you the strength to keep on walking. I'm going to be walking an 873 kilometer journey. I don't know where my destination is. He said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, step out to a place where I will show you. <laughs> in other words keep on walking till I say stop as long as there's energy there's life in your lungs there's life in your breath sorry life in your breath and your body and air in your lungs keep on walking I don't know where I'm going keep on walking I know what tomorrow is going keep on walking if he said it he'll do it if he started it he will bring it to pass he says, are you not the God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave? He says, this thing that they want to contend over, you have already given it to me. Let me say to somebody, anything that God has for you is for you. Yes. Let them walk on their heads. Let them contest it. it was, he says, listen, this land that they're coming to fight, you already gave it to our father's father. Listen, every promise for you as long as God it has left the word or the mouth of God, whether they like it or not, if systems have to collapse, <laughs> if people have to be reshuffled, if if if, if <laughs> the Bible says that the king lost sleep, <laughs> it says that the king lost sleep. He said, "What must be done for the one who pleases the king?" 
He says, "What? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, you know, I know. It hasn't been done before. But listen, listen, listen. What must be done if they have to call people in?" He says, and <laughs> he says he was asking about Mordecai and was Haman just so happened to show up at that moment. So perfect timing. Haman come, the enemy. He come, come. What must be done? And he was thinking that he was describing for himself. Not knowing that he was doing. See, he says that the wealth of the wicked is being stored up for the righteous. Hear me. They think that they are building for themselves. Now I've shifted prophetically. Here, this is somebody here today. They think they are building for themselves. But they have no idea that they are building for you. It's clear. And, and he will do it in such a way that he will confuse them. So they will not see or know what they are doing. Haman walked into the trap thinking that, yes, finally, I've gotten favor for the king. But he was handcrafting the reward for Mordecai. Whatever needs to be done, your name is on it. He says to them, he says, you gave it to Abraham, your friend forever. Continue. Look at what he says to God. And they dwell in it and they have built you a sanctuary in it. Your name saying what? What did they say? He says, if disaster should ever come upon us, sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your what? In your presence. For your name is in this temple. In other words, anywhere the name of God is, there is a temple for you to run into. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. That it is not about you being in church physically. You can be in your office and you usher the name of the Lord. You are in a strong tower. He says, we will stand before your name for your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. He says, see, what do you do when you are in the situation? You remind God of his word. He says, God, remember you said this. You said, if disaster or affliction should come upon me, I will stand here. And if I stand here and usher your name, and utter your name before this place, you will save me. 